To celebrate the release of the Apollo X series, Universal Audio flew me, Fab DuPont, out to London where they have fantastic weather, drive on the proper side of the road and, more importantly, have some of the best producers, musicians and studios in the world. I was there to help make the first professional recording session using only Apollo X. The song ended up a little something like this. I'm far away I know I stay, I know I stay right there with you And though it might be too late What would you say, what would you say, what would you do? And this is the story of how that was made. The idea was to work with the band Two Door Cinema Club as well as their producer Jack Knifley and have them revisit one of their most famous singles, Sun, Apollo X style. Our first meeting was at their Airbnb where they had set up a small rig to open the existing sessions, pick parts, make choices, try new ideas and prep the session for the next day recording at Air Studios. The idea today was just to find little events, little moments. We weren't kind of looking to reinvent the wheel, just making noise. And um, I just thought it'd be nice to put some more synthetic noises in since we're, since we're working with an orchestra, mm -hmm. um, to kind of pull it in the other direction as well and just kind of open it up as far as possible, so. The Oberheim and the Odyssey and the Oscar were plugged straight into the, the XX, and then you were doing things in the console on the way into Logic. Yeah. Can you, what was that? What, what are you doing? Well, lots of times, if Alex is coming up with sounds, we record everything. Because even the intention was on, on this was to replace the world, sir. But he kind of, within about 30 seconds, he was doing something else. Usually when Alex is playing, I'm plugging in guitar. And if you're switching around pedals, there's a gap. Um, but this was kind of fun just to insert something. I know it was being recorded, so there will be moments where it's, there's no reverb and suddenly a reverb will appear, but obviously you're in danger of ruining a good take, mm -hmm. but it's the accidental things that happens. I think Alex doesn't mind me doing it anymore. I'm sure, um, and he's, you know, uh, we were kind of tripping each other up a bit, but it's in those little things that you get a, something exciting happening. In the end, the day was spent auditioning tracks, muting parts, playing with fun old keyboards and making sure the session was ready for the live recording at air the next day. After a much-deserved fish and chips and a night of rest, we arrived at the late Sir George Martin's fabulous air studios to track live drums, bass, guitars and vocals for the Apollo X version of Sun. As for any self-respecting indie pop record, the foundation of the track is the drums, which we tracked live in Studio B using only Apollo X and Unison preamps. So for example, I have three kicks, right? We have the kick in, the 112, um, we have kick out the 47, and then we have the sub kick. The sub kick, I kept really clean because I just wanted the transients, I didn't want any, anything, I just wanted to be pure and it gives that really nice pillowy bottom and you don't have to do anything to it. The kick in, I used a 1073 and I did nothing processing wise. Uh, the kick out, I used also a 1073 and I added a little bit of bottom to the FET 47 because it's an 18 inch bass drum. And so it's really punchy and it's really fast and it doesn't ring forever and it's wonderful to record uh, as, as we know now. Um, really good choice on your end, but it doesn't have the same like 100 hertz or 200 hertz push than a 22 or 24 would have. So I, fi I faked it. And so I EQ'd it with the 1073 on the way in. The other thing I did is because we had to ensconce the drummer into this thing, there was a little bit of a phase mm -hmm. um, feedback on the inside kick drum mic. And I went back and forth um, like five times to try and find the right spot. Then I got really lazy. <clears throat> so I... Um, I put the little IBP on it and I actually adjusted the phase of the inside kick drum mic in real time from here and that's being printed to Logic. And the reason why I did the inside kick drum mic is because there's almost no bleed of anything else inside in the inside kick drum mic. If I did that on the outside kick drum mic, I would probably ruin the snare sound. 
But mm -hmm. on the inside, keep your mind, nobody cares. So uh, don't tell my mother. This is against the rules. Um, but it's really great to be able to have this plugin in real time on the way in. John here at Air found this ribbon microphone. I don't even know what it is. Some old crusty looking thing. And it sounded great. So what I did with that is I ran it into uh, 1176 and I'm compressing it um, beyond reason. And I'm recording that. And that gives it that kit mic. And then I did it. And you also had a 67 aspect, which I had never done. So, um, so I thought it was pretty cool. And I put it super low behind a drummer, almost on the, on the ground and facing at the bass. Drum. And that gives this really cool thing. Let, let me show you. So that's the 67 with the 1176. And this is the, that ribbon with the, um, the 1176 also. Really nice. And the, yeah, it's cool. And the two of them with the snare, it's really nice. Without the parallel compression, the snare is great, mm -hmm. but this really does the trick. And then the whole kit, the rooms are actually outside the booth, and our collective bet was that it was going to suck, but Alex's bet is like, nothing can suck here, and so it sounds like this. With no processing in Logic, everything is just done with the preamps and these four plugins, and that's it. When you put a plugin on the Unison slot, the behavior changes because it's a different plugin with a different behavior. Mm -hmm. So if you're using a 610B, it's going to behave a certain way and the gain is going to go a certain way. Yeah. And if you're using a 1073, just like if you were switching hardware, it's going to behave another way. Uh, but it's quite inspiring because you can really hear the impact of what changing a preamp does on the microphone. If you do that in real life, you plug it in, you listen to it, then you have to mute to not explode your speakers, unplug, replug, match levels, and then listen again. Here, you just it's so fast, you can really tell the difference between the two preamps, mm -hmm. pretty cool. Every choice we've made is recorded and committed, period. Today was probably the first professional hardcore recording session, and we did it all with Apollo, with nothing else. It's 100% all Apollo, and it's the same thing tomorrow for the orchestra, it's gonna be all Apollo all Apollo converters. Strings really show, like big ensembles and big air like this really shows what a converter can do. So it's gonna be very interesting. We will be able to hear the results. It's gonna be beautiful. The rest of the band was also tracked through an Apollo X recorded through the real-time UAD plugins. For example, I use a Studio A800 tape plugin to soften the guitars as I usually do, and a US610B unison preamp on bass, Lastly, for the SM7 on lead vocals, I used the Neve 1073 Unison preamp. By the end of the day, we had tracked everything we needed for this new version of Sun, except for a small detail, the London Metropolitan Orchestra. Davide, yes. you are responsible for the score. Yes. Okay, so how did this come together? Like, um, Jackknife calls you for some of his stuff? Yeah, I've been with working with Jackknife for a bunch of years now, about 2011 or 12, and we've been doing some records together. And we usually work as, um, I usually do all my string arranging, um, it's usually me playing every instrument. So you arrange, you write the score, and then you I play I don't it. actually write, I just record every instrument. So you got the track, did uh, um, Jack Knife tell you, okay, I want it to be monstrous, or do whatever you want, or I want to hear timpanis, right. or bells. Well, yeah, we have an idea of, so, especially with Jack Knife, it's very much like we really want a specific about what type of sounds we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, so really it's a process of, um, it gives me some ideas, some references, and then, and then it's really up to me to come up with these ideas and put them down, recording the strings of, as I do, programming the other instruments of the orchestra, and then sending back and forth. And that took about a week because there was a lot of 
fine, fine adjusting. So, so essentially, everything's been done twice. You, you built a demo that was like real playing, yeah. full demo of everything, programmed the percussion, programmed the marimba, Correct. and then we came here and then we redid it for real. Correct. I find it's really nice when you get a really nice, tight environment because then you can really manipulate it as you want to go against the guitar or the drums to come out in a um, dynamic way. Who came up with the idea for the, the tubular bales? Me. <laughs> Where did that come from? Well, because I just like the instrument a lot. That's a crazy answer. I always love when the tubular bells come at the end and they come just like with that few notes, you know, and, and it's like, wow. Great. Well, this is wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And it came out great. And it's, it's difficult to imagine when you hear the raw track how the orchestra is going to fit. But then when you hear the orchestra on top of it, you're like, where has the orchestra been all our life? It's amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. It's not every day that uh, you get to see the London Metropolitan Orchestra recorded in the hall at AR Studios, so I thought it would be interesting to have some information about how it was done. And since I had absolutely nothing to do with it, I thought it'd be a lot more interesting to ask the person who actually put it together, Olga Fitzroy. So, how many players did we have? 54. 54 players. How many microphones did you have, roughly? Roughly about between 40 and 50. Between 40 and 50 microphones, definitely in a quiet taste. So, what's going on? How did you do this? So I guess the main mics we use are the Decca tree up there. It's three M50s. Decca doesn't mean 10. Decca is D-E-C-C-A as for the record company. For those of you who did not know, there's only three microphones. Yeah, so that's kind of like the main pickup and it's like really common for any kind of film scores. So it's sort of a good starting point for the orchestra. So three microphones yeah. for the whole orchestra. Yeah, and that gives you like a kind of general picture of what it sounds like in the room. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so they're vintage. Neumann M50s. Okay. If we look up, we see this unbelievable contraption, <laughs> which actually is on motors and comes up and down. Yeah. What's that for? So that is to control the acoustic. I mean, even like now, it's obviously you can hear it's really reverberant. Yeah. Um, and so actually during the session when we first listened to it, it was like it's you know quite a big track, really dynamic, and going against a quite a dry pop track, we needed to actually bring down the reverb time, so we lowered the ceiling right down to it's about the same height as the edge of the gallery, a mm -hmm. little bit higher than that. Yeah. And that sort of controls the acoustics and you just get less reverb. It makes a big difference. Yeah. So it's, it's, I think it's four, four and a bit seconds of reverb in this room, so. It, it's wild how efficient it is. Yeah. It's really nice. Thanks very much, Olga. Pleasure. And uh, have a nice uh, time tearing down this uh, couple of microphones. Yeah, I might need to go out for dinner, I think. <laughs> <laughs> So guys, we are at the end of day four. I know it feels like yesterday, but it was four days ago we started this, this madness thing of the all Apollo rework of your 2012 Sun Song. From the you know, recording like OB8 in an in a Airbnb four days ago to recording the Metropolitan Orchestra at air. What was fun, what was special, what was different? It's been amazing. Um kind of every stage has um, been better than I could have imagined. And um, I'm also amazed at how much uh, I've learned from um, being in this, this situation, not, not just about um, how all of this works, but um, I've, been using, I've been using Apollos for years and missed so many things. Um, so that, that's, been, that's been really fascinating. From uh, Monday, which were when we were recording the band, I, um, I think I'm altered. I think my workflow has, my whole um, uh, idea of using hardware is, has, been, has been upended. The, the card has been upended. So I've got to go back and recover and figure out how this, things like mic prees, which I don't really care too much about. I haven't because I don't have that many of them. I've got a few things 
But I always go to the same ones because they're easy. But now I have this, the twin on my desk. So now I'm going to be choosing things. And it's, it's kind of interesting to hear possibilities. I mean, we could probably record it again. Mm -hmm. And it could be completely different. You know, it's just that was this week's version of Sun. All right, fine. So we'll see you again in six years yeah. for the 2024 version of, Coral of Sun. Version. Coral version, yes. And uh, until then, I am super um, excited to uh, get your mix and to hear what it sounds like. I hope it's good. I have no fear. All in all, it packed four days of Apollo X fun and music with Tudor Cinema Club, from a bedroom to the Lyndhurst Hall at Air Studios with the London Metropolitan Orchestra. It came out great. Please take a few minutes to watch and listen to the final result. Thanks to Universal Audio for inviting us to be part of the maiden voyage of the Apollo X. Over and out. See you back in the US, where I'm told we drive on the wrong side of the road.